Cool. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. It's pretty early, or at least for me, it's pretty early still. Um, so let's see where we can take this. And so that everybody wakes up, um, what does my Twitter handle have to do with my name? There's some correlation. Who can see it? Yeah, it's early. Yes, it's a rot 13. So if you take my last name and rotate the letters by 13, this is what you get. And that's how I got my Twitter handle. Um, so thanks, everybody, for waking up. And let's see where we can take this about logging. So um, a lot of you might do something like this. Um, Who is doing something like this? Cat? Yeah, OK, I see way too many hands. We will try to fix that. Uh, maybe you're doing something like this. You're doing tail f. Who is doing tail f? OK. Um, but there's some, something even better. Um, do you know less plus f? Anybody knows what the advantage is of that? If you do less plus f, um, you will still follow the file like tail f, but what you can then do is you can break out of that and then just search through the file, scroll around it, uh, go to the beginning, the end, if you know the shortcuts. Um, so it's a bit better than tail f, but this is still not what you want to do for logging, because at some point, this becomes painful. At first, you probably think, this is fine, and <laughs> you're sitting there and think everything is fine, kind of. And then you keep doing this, and then you will, your window will look something like this, and later on, it will look something like this. And then nothing is fine anymore. And we kind of want to avoid this problem, uh, where you're sitting in the middle of the fire and think, well, everything is crap. And we try to kind of get past it. So what can we do? We want to log all the things, but do it in a better way than just what the shell or take, tail or less or whatever can offer. Um, so I work for Elastic. Um, I'm a developer advocate, so I spend a lot of time speaking about the good stuff that we do uh, and showing off our software. So let's see what that is. Um, so you've probably seen that one, Elasticsearch, that is kind of the core thing we have, uh, which is underpinning everything. Because for us, search is kind of the core technology. And if you're searching on these sites, behind the search box, there's always Elasticsearch uh, doing the work for you. And over the time, people realize that, well, Logging might be a search problem as well, because storing the logs is kind of not the important thing, but everybody wants to find the logs. Nobody cares about storing them, but searching them is kind of the relevant thing. So what then happened was two more projects joined, and we have Kibana for the visualization, and Logstash to kind of ingest and transform and enrich data. And together, um, they became very powerful, and they're the infamous Elk stack. Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana. You can see it's the Elk. Um, and the Elk stack, I guess you get that one. And well, that one is also widely used. So for the logging use case, either security, analytics, or just events, these three sites, if you're playing any games with Blizzard, uh, especially around the launch, they have like huge dashboards to see what is going on. Or Slack is doing a lot of security events around it, that. Um, and then we added one more thing, Beats. The problem was Logstash is kind of nice. Uh, but it was originally written in Ruby and is now JRuby, so you always need the JVM. And if people were not using the JVM, they were kind of like not so happy to roll out the JVM everywhere to collect log files. Especially if you're kind of a Ruby, PHP, .NET, whatever developer, uh, not using the JVM, just rolling out the JVM just for the logs was not the best thing for lots of people. So then we added Beats, which is like a lightweight agent or forwarder written in Go, so you have native binaries. Uh, and it's just like shipping stuff in a very performant fashion. The problem is then, um, how does B fit into Elk? And then we kind of figured out maybe the Elk is more of an Elk B or Belk personality, uh, which could look something like this. So you can see it's still the B, but it has the Elk horns, so that's the Belk or the Elk B. Um, and we nearly made that the new logo or name. However, since we're always about scalability, um, even marketing figured out at some point that this does not scale. Because what happens if we add one more open source product? We'll probably add one more letter, and then we'll need to redo the entire branding and marketing. And it will also get even harder to make up another animal. Whatever that letter might be, um, coming from Belk or Elk B, like, I'm not sure whatever animal we could make out of that. Uh, so we kind of went with the boring route now, and we tried to call it the Elastic Stack. And look something like this. So 
We'll use all these components today. So I will use beats like as a lightweight forwarder, agent, chip, or whatever you want to call it. Um, in that specific case, since we're talking about log files today, um, I'll use file beat. But there are other beats about metrics, for example, pinging systems, security events, network traffic, different beats for different purposes. But we'll figure uh, or focus on logs today. We also have Logstash for parsing data and enriching it. Then we have Elasticsearch to store your data and Kibana on top of that to visualize what is going on. So all of that and what I'm showing you today is Apache 2 license, so you can just use it for free um, and you're good to go. So I built highly monitored Hello World applications, um, and we'll just do that and take a look at one of these highly monitored or logged Hello World applications today. So, I'll use Java today, but it doesn't really matter. You could use any other programming language. Um, I'll use Java and Lockback, but you could use pretty much any other programming language and just use uh, uh, the right log appender for that language. Um, for example, Monolog for PHP um, or whatever your programming language is, you'll probably know what the right log appender or your preferred log appender is. Um, probably you can do the same thing. I'll just use Java as an example. So let's start off with parsing. We'll basically dive into five different approaches for logging and how to approach logging. Uh, first off, uh, we'll parse. So what we do is we have a classic log file that is kind of the thing on the left-hand side, that's the classic log file, and then we'll have the file beat to collect that log file and forward it to Logstash, that's the one in the middle, and then Logstash will parse the log file and then store the result into Elasticsearch and Kibana can then query that data out of it. So this is pretty much the architecture that we want to have. Um, so I have that running. Uh, let's quickly head over to Kibana. If you've never seen Kibana, um, this is Kibana, the latest version. Um, I always say uh, 3 was black, version 4 was white, 5 colorful, and 6 is blue now. And blue is kind of more readable if you're colorblind, so that's a win for that. So let's collapse that one here because we don't really need that. Um, just to quickly give you an idea of what we even have running here. Um, this is all containerized. The code is online. You'll have the link at the end so you can play around with that uh, as well. So we'll have, or we are having one Elasticsearch instance to store the data. We'll have one Kibana instance to interact with it. We have one Logstash instance with one pipeline running. We can take a look at the pipeline a bit later on. And then we have two beats to collect data and forward it. Why we need two beats, you will see uh, in a few moments. Um, so let's see what we have here. Um, or actually, let's start somewhere else. Let's start here um, with my log application. Let's switch that to uh, presentation mode. So this is very simple, and probably regardless of whatever pro uh, programming language you're using, you can understand what is going on. Um, this is not production code, like I said. This is a Hello World application. Uh, this is my Hello World application for logging. So basically, we have a loop. We'll iterate over that 10 times. Uh, we have one session key for the entire thing, and then we'll also store the loop, so we have some structured information. Um, I'm using MDC, uh, Map Diagnostic Context, um, which is a Java thing, but it's basically structured log information. Because sometimes it's nice to have structured log information. I'll show you in a few moments why you might want structured log information. And then we'll just have some log messages. So we'll have info warn, we'll throw an exception, and we'll try to collect all of that. This is the entire program that we're running, and I've already been running that, and we have the log file, and now we want to kind of store that in a nice fashion so that we don't have to use less anymore. So if you have the classic log file, um, um, <laughs> that's the one I want. Um, if you have the classic log file, uh, you can just uh, either show it or let's just quickly run it uh, so you can see what this is doing. Um, if you run that, it might be a bit small, but you can kind of see uh, what is going on. So we have some information, uh, and now we need to parse that because we've basically written that out to a log file, and we need to parse that log file. Uh, let's take one example here. Uh, let's take that one line, and we need to parse that because, well, that is all we have just to show you uh, less, uh, this is the right one. So this is the, the log file that we have collected. And now we want to parse it, because we have a lot of good information in here, uh, but it's a bit unusable right now, because you can see we have here, we have a date, we have a timestamp, we have a log level, we have the class that has been logging, uh, 
We have the method, we have a session, we have a loop, and we have a log message. Or here, we would have a stack trace. I would kind of want to dive into and find what this is doing. So let's take, I've already copied uh, my one log message, and now we need to parse that. Because, well, that's what parsing is for. Uh, we've recently added the grog debugger. So what the grog debugger here basically does is, I'm adding the log line here, um, and then I can add a pattern and try to parse the different pieces of information out of that message um, in a relatively easy way. So who likes writing regular expressions? I guess that's the Stockholm Syndrome. Um, because I personally don't like it that much. Um, we, we can discuss afterwards um, how you can break out of uh, the Stockholm Syndrome for that one. Uh, but let's quickly try to, to parse a little bit of what we have here. Um, so for example here, the whole thing starts with a square bracket. So I have a square bracket, and then since it's a regular expression, you need to escape that. And then uh, we have grok here. Um, if you're not familiar with grok, grok is basically named regular expressions. So there are a lot of patterns that we have already prepared for you, and they have a specific name, and you can just use the regular expression uh, under that name. So as long as you know how it's called, you can just use that directly. And the one for timestamp uh, and date is called timestamp, 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 if I can type it. I hope I, I didn't mistype, otherwise correct me. Uh, that's uh, 8601. And then we'll call this field timestamp in the output. So this here is the grog pattern. This is basically the pattern which we have added uh, to parse this highlighted information up here. So that regular expression has a specific name, which is timestamp ISO 8601. And we'll store the result, the parsed result, under the field timestamp. So this is the pattern, colon, the field under which we want to store it. Um, and then, um, obviously, I've forgotten. You always need curly braces uh, around the pattern. Uh, then you can say, OK, uh, the square bracket is closed again. And then we can actually simulate that. And ooh, I didn't mistype, so it could parse the timestamp. And this has read it out in the correct timestamp format. And then you could say, OK, next up, we have a space. You could either type a space, but you, uh, we have a placeholder. This is not what I wanted. Uh, this is the right field where I want to be. Uh, you can say space. Um, this is basically this space. And since I'm not giving it a name, we're basically discarding that. And then we have the log level. Uh, so here, uh, we can parse the log level. And well, this is called log level log level, and I'll just call the field level, and if I didn't mistype, it can parse it out. And well, I could write it for the rest of the line, but probably this is not much fun watching me write that. Um, so I'll, I'll cheat, and I'll just copy it out uh, from the pattern that I've created. Um, and the entire pattern looks like this. And then if you simulate that, well, it can parse it out. And this one can also uh, parse my stack traces. That's why the end looks a bit complicated, uh, where you have the new lines and, and stuff like that. Do you still enjoy writing that? Um, at least I personally don't. Uh, but maybe it's a kind of job security, because you probably can spend half a day writing regular expressions to parse some log files. And if you create a new format, you will write another half day uh, some uh, regular expressions for that. Um, yeah, so it's not that much fun, uh, but it does its job. Uh, so um, if I switch to the parse um, index here, and well, timestamps are a thing, and I have index that's kind of like slightly off with the timestamp, you can see this is basically what the parsed message looks like. So here, I have taken my original message, and this is the message field, like this is the original message. And here, I have broken it up into all the independent parse. Uh, Parts. So for example, you can see, OK, this was the thread, uh, or the, the method in that case. Uh, you can see um, the log level. And you can also get statistics out of that once you have that. For example, if I click on level, you can see I have info, warn, and error, and the distribution here. And if you click on a plus, that would filter down. You can see here, it has filtered down on only the errors. So on, in total, I have 12 errors, though uh, in my test system, I have 72 uh, messages in total. So you can very easily uh, filter down on that. You could also visualize stuff. So if I get go over to visualizations, let's, let's use a pie chart. Um, and I would say uh, I want to have the parsed file. 
and I want to split it up, and I want to see this session information. So every, it's basically like a user ID or the session or whatever uh, structured information you have in there. And you could then just say, I want to aggregate on that and see uh, how many users are using my system. So I say, I want to break this down on a specific term, and the term I'm interested in is the session. And I say, I want to see the top 15 sessions I have in my system. And if you break it down, I mean, these are pretty randomly uh, yeah, assigned since I just call a, a random function. Uh, but you can see 60 was by chance uh, the most active session, whereas the other ones were not that active, whereas like 60 had uh, six occurrences um, and uh, uh, 32 only five, etc. So here you could break it down and then see, see uh, what they're doing. Uh, you can also say, I want only to see the session of a specific user. So for example, if I say here is session, and then I could say is, and I think 60 was the most common one, I only want to see what the user 60 or the session 60 has been up to, uh, you could filter down on that. So I guess this is a bit more powerful than just grabbing through a, a log file, and you can get better statistics and actually search stuff and see it, and you can also centralize it. Um, but writing this regular expression is kind of like boring, and it's not that much fun. So maybe we have any, some better alternatives. So kind of the pros are, if you have an existing application, you don't need to touch anything in the application. You can just take the existing log file that you probably have, and then you need to write the regular expression to parse it. But yeah, I'm not a fan of that regex part. So let's see if we can find a better approach. Uh, one thing that you could say is we could send that directly, because my application knows the structure of that information. It has, it has all the information, and it's just writing that out in a single line. And then, well, I don't need to parse it back, but I could send that directly. So what we're doing here now is basically the application, or basically my log appender, log back in that case. My uh, log appender is basically sending the information in a structured format to log slash directly. I don't need to do any parsing. And I can just see it directly in Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, yeah, let's... Um, not what I wanted. Or where is my IntelliJ? Um, let's run it one more time. Uh, let's run it one more time, and then we can see uh, in in the send index, we can see these were the messages we have just sent. And if I unfold that one, uh, you can see oh. This is kind of nicer. You, don't, you see, we don't have this original message because we didn't have to do any parsing. Uh, but we have all the relevant information. So we have the loop information, and we have a port, and uh, the session should be somewhere here. Um, so you have all the information, but you didn't need to do any parsing. All you had to do is was you had to add something to the log appender. So I have, I'm using logback, but it could be pretty much any log appender. Uh, let's switch that to the presentation mode again. So basically what I have here is uh, we have the console output. This is what you're seeing in IntelliJ. Um, I having the log file. This is probably the classic approach that you're using, and that was the one that we have been parsing initially. So you can see I've defined my patterns, how that should look like. Uh, I have a rotation pattern, so I will only keep up to seven days of my log files. Um, but I don't want to do the parsing. And the next thing, that is what I've just done, is that is sending the data directly to Logstash. And I don't need to do any parsing. And yeah, you need to add one more dependency, and you need to add that to your log appender, but otherwise you don't need to change anything in your application. Uh, this is all you need. Basically, I'm telling it, okay, Logstash is running on localhost on that port. Um, use those uh, serialization methods or uh, encoders, and that's all I need. I don't need to do any more parsing or hard work around that. Um, any idea what might be a problem around that? Sorry? Yeah, the availability of Logstash, that is actually a very good point. Um, so while this works and you've seen the data is there, um, this has some downsides. One of these downsides is, um, or let's start with the upsides. The upside is you don't need to write out the file and then need to parse it back. That's also like kind of like unnecessary work because first you're writing out something, then you're reading it back and you're parsing it again. That's kind of unnecessary overhead. Um, the problem is, as you've said, if Logstash is down or if your network is down or if anything is not working in your system, you will not be able to receive your log messages. And that is kind of unfortunate because especially when stuff is not working as expected, you probably want to see your log messages. 
So especially when something happens on a network, uh, you want to see what is happening in your application, and you want, don't want to be blind. So that is a major downside. Um, also, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, by default, the, the, the logback sends the data asynchronously, um, but the queue is only 200 megabytes large. So once you have queued up to 200 megabytes of logs, the oldest logs will just be thrown away, and you will never be able to get them back. Uh, the other thing is that you have pretty tight coupling. Because every time you change something in your log session infrastructure, you need to change uh, your, uh, your configuration in your application. So suddenly, when you change something in your logging infrastructure, you need to re kind of roll out your entire application again. So that's also not that, very, not that, that, that nice, because you will need to roll it out again. Um, let's try to write it out in a structured format directly. Um, so basically, what we're doing here is I'm changing my log appender. I'm writing out JSON directly since, well, Elasticsearch stores JSON, so JSON is kind of a good format. It could be any uh, kind of like structured format. It could be key value store, it could be like comma separated, anything that you can parse easily would work. But JSON is the easiest since well. We're using Elasticsearch and it can store JSON directly. So what I will do is I will write out my JSON file directly. The file beat will then collect that file and can forward that directly to Elasticsearch and Kibana. I don't even need log session anymore. I just can do everything uh, with my file beat. Uh, what that looks like in my log file is something like this. Here, once again, I have this uh, logback uh, dependency that I need to add to my project, uh, but otherwise it's pretty simple. You can see uh, I'm writing out another file, uh, but this time it has the extension JSON. Uh, it can be rotated as well, and I basically say, like, this is the pattern of how my log message should look like. So these are all the fields that I want to get out of that. And, well, that's pretty easy. Um, uh, less logs, Jason. Just that you get the idea. Um, this here would be one entry. So this is already structured. You don't need to do any parsing or anything anymore. You can basically store that directly into Elasticsearch since well. That is the right format that you want. And that totally works. Um, so let's head over to Structured. And you can see um, this does the right thing as well. So no more uh, work or no more parsing to do. Um, this is just doing the right thing for you. Uh, what are the upsides and downsides for that? Um, the good thing is, once you write it out in the right format, you're pretty much done. Uh, the downside is you have another dependency, and well, you need to add that configuration to write it out in the right format. Um, though, in my opinion, this is the best way. And this is also generally the one of the three I've shown so far that we would recommend. So the one about sending data directly to Logsash is the one that is probably the worst, because, well, you can lose data. And if you're using a bad uh, sender to Logstash, it might uh, add more and more threats and kill your application at some point if you cannot reach the logging system, if it's implemented in a bad way. Writing it out to the log file is still valid. Uh, it's just not that nice to write, write the regular expressions. Um, what if you want to containerize your applications? Um, because, well, you know, you always have these problems. Uh, it works on my machine, and afterwards you can say it works on my container, uh, but nowhere else. But you still probably want to have some logging and show people what you want to do. Um, so how do you run FileBeat if you want to collect from a container? Generally, you, don't, you can pack it on the host system if you want to do that. You could also package it into your container with the application, but that's generally not recommended. It will make the size larger, and again, you have this coupling problem. Uh, but you can just run it as a sidecar. So you have your Java application running, or whatever application you have running, and then you have another standalone container just with FileBeat to collect the log files. And you have two ways to collect the log files then. Either you're uh, relying on the default JSON log that Docker is collecting, and then you can basically say, like, collect everything. Because normally it stores that under varlib docker containers and then the docker container ID, docker container ID dot log. This is where every container by default is putting its log. And basically, um, if you mount that directory into the file bit container, it can just contain, uh, collect everything and store that JSON file or forward that JSON file to Elasticsearch directly. What you can also do is, that is kind of nice, are the last two lines, these processors, at Docker metadata. Um, this will go to the doc, uh, Docker socket and actually query it around about some parameters. For example, uh, for my application, it could figure out, okay, 
And this is the container ID. This is the name of the app of my container. This is the image that I'm using it. And if you have any labels, this could be as many labels as you have. Um, if you have any labels, uh, these are all the labels you have. And then later on, you can search or filter based on this Docker information as well, if you have the ID, so you can correlate those. The other approach you could use is, for example, if you start your Java application, uh, you can could mount out the, the directory where you're storing the log file, and then mount that directory. So that is volumes. The last line is basically, I'm storing uh, under opt my Java logs. I'm storing my log files in my container. I mounted out. Uh, to the host system under logs my Java, and that logs my Java, um, I'm mounting that into my file bit configuration then, and then you could just collect that like any regular file. And this appears to uh, file bit as if there was no container anymore, and this is pretty much as if it was on localhost. The downside is, since we don't have any connection to the Docker information anymore, we don't have the ID, we cannot correlate the Docker information. So we cannot add the labels or the Docker base image that you have, which is probably a downside for that. Um, you can also do uh, more fancy stuff like configuration. So for example, here we are saying, if my image is based on a specific image, and I'm saying if it's based on the Redis image, um, I want Redis has these fancy ASCII character lines in the beginning when it starts up, which don't add any value, and you probably don't want to lock them because they're pretty much garbage. Um, and you can just filter them out by saying, like, if something is based on the Redis image, um, then run this configuration. And basically it says, like, take that container, take its ID, and exclude the following lines. And that is the right regular expression. Um, luckily, we have created that for you already, to throw away uh, this banner. And you could use something like this to exclude any banners that you have and don't want to log. Um, yeah. The advantage, it's kind of like the hot stuff that everybody wants to use. Um, the disadvantage is it adds some more complexity. And what we often see is that people who don't know our stack and who don't know Docker think that combining two complex things will give them a miracle and everything will just work. Um, but that's not the case. Uh, we're basically, like for our Docker images, we're always doing part-time Docker support, or at least it feels like that, because every th second question we get is around Docker. So if you're familiar with Docker, do that. If you're not familiar with Docker, um, please learn Docker first and our system first, and only then try to combine them. Otherwise, chaos. OK. What if you want to do orchestration? And I guess orchestration by now pretty much means Kubernetes. Um, where do you put FileBeat? Um, there's this concept of, so it's generally a sidecar again, but there in Kubernetes there is this uh, concept of a daemon set. And a daemon set runs basically on every host you have. There is one specific pod is running once, or the number you, you can define the number of times it runs. But normally you would define that there is one instance of FileBeat running on every host. So you have one file bit pod running on every single host to collect your log files. And that is how you would collect those. Um, you can enrich your metadata as well. So if that pro, uh, pod is part of the cluster, you can just say in cluster, and then it would know where to query uh, the information from Kubernetes and enrich that. If it's not part of the cluster, you would need to uh, actually configure where it can reach Kubernetes to query its API to get that information. What you would get out of that is something like this. Um, again, you have the container information, but you also get stuff like the namespace uh, or the node name or the pod. Then you can enrich every single event and then filter down on that to figure out what is going on. Um, you can also do the configuration templates. So here we are pretty much doing the same thing we've been doing before uh, by filtering out that Redis header. Um, another fancy thing that you can do is you can say for every namespace that you have, you want to have a different index. So you can split it up by use case or by namespace. And basically, if you have the Kubernetes enrichment information added, uh, you can then say in the index name for the output, you can say Kubernetes namespace, colon, the fi uh, file bit, um, and then the, the, the version, and then the timestamp. So that would allow you to actually break up your logs into the different namespaces and not have everything mixed together into one, uh, but have like a bit more of a clear tenant separation here. Um, yeah, it's even hotter, um, but it has also more complexity um, that you need to learn. Um, if you're already using Kubernetes, um, yeah, sure, do that, enjoy that. If you don't, um, it's probably not the best use case to get started there, or at least I'm always cautious. OK, to wrap up, um, if you want to get the code, um, I'm probably adding some more stuff, but this is maybe the most relevant slide. This is where the entire code lives. Uh, I just told it, 
Java logging because I might do a version for PHP or some other programming languages as well. Uh, but this is just the same the stuff. You get all the, the Docker images to run it and can just try uh, to run that very simply. You basically need Java and Gradle and Docker Compose and then Kubernetes, and then you can go crazy and try everything out. Um, so to conclude, basically, we've kind of covered five different approaches of what you can do. Uh, the first one was to parse, which is if you like regular expressions, it's probably the right thing, and you don't need to change anything in your application, so it's the easiest way to get started. Uh, but it's also a bit tedious, especially if you have lots of different log formats, it's probably not what you want to do. Then you can send something directly uh, to Logstash, and that, in my example, it was TCP. You could even do that by UDP, but that's then very much a best effort logging. Um, and normally, the logs that you need the most are not there, um, and you can never trust the system if the stuff that you're looking for is really there or not. So, yeah, it's a bit less overhead, but probably not the one you want. Um, and generally, that's kind of like the, the approach I would recommend the least. Uh, you can structure everything out by writing it as JSON. That is generally what we recommend, writing it out in a structured format and then collecting it directly. If you containerize it, you can enrich the information and just kind of filter down on that as well. And for orchestration, we do the same thing, uh, that we can enrich it with info, uh, the basic information of the container or the orchestration framework. Uh, but otherwise, nothing really changes. As long as you uh, log in a structured format, you don't have to do anything specific around containers or uh, orchestration. You can just add some metadata, but otherwise, you're good to go. Um, and with that, we have 10 minutes for questions. And before everybody runs off, I always take a picture with you. Um, so I can prove to my colleagues that I've been working today. Because this time I'm in Vienna, and they, they might know where I'm at home, uh, but my colleagues normally don't know where I am. So smile, everybody. Very good. Um, by the way, we have some stickers up front. Uh, if you're quick afterwards when you leave, uh, you can have stickers. Um, can we have any questions, please, if there are any? <laughs> Logging and GDPR, how do you manage that? Um, that's actually another talk that I'm doing. Um, that's an interesting one. So um, GDPR is a bit of a pain in the ass around logging, because all the relevant information that you want to have uh, is often sensitive. Um, it really depends. So for some information, like IP addresses, which are also uh, personal information, we normally hash them. Because the good thing is, for IP addresses, as one example is, you want to aggregate on them, so you want to know how many unique IP addresses have been accessing your system, how much traffic has been coming from one specific IP address, but you don't necessarily need the specific address. As long as you have the hash and can aggregate on that, that's still working. So for some information, you can hash it. Um, other information, you probably need to keep in a different system to keep it compliant. Um, if you're interested in depth, like we have an entire webinar on just GDPR compliance around logging uh, and all the techniques around that. We also have some blog posts, but that's kind of like more in-depth uh, system. Second question. It's not called Elk anymore. Wait, where did my... Oh, no, logging it. Oh, yeah. Uh, why is Elk better than Greylog? Um, firstly, it's not Elk anymore. It's Elasticstack. Uh, but yeah, I, I know. Uh, we've been trying to get the message out, uh, and it will take some time. Uh, so the advantage of Greylog is uh, that it's kind of a one-trick pony, that it's, it does only logging. So the setup process for that is very smooth, because well, they're all optimized for one specific use case. Um, the ElkSec is probably a bit harder to configure, but now with the beats, we've tried to make it much simpler. And if you look at the code that I've shown, most of the stuff is pretty simple. So as long as you log out in a structured format, uh, that should be relatively simple. The big advantage of the Elastic Stack then is it's not just for logging. You can do metrics, you can do APM, you can keep your business data in there. And for us, the biggest value normally comes from having all the information combined and not just one system for logs, one system for metrics, one system for business data. And then you don't really get the big picture and can combine the information, but it's one island and the next island and then another island. Though we're very happy that Greylog is actually based on Elasticsearch, and I, I know the founder, Leonard. Uh, I've recently even been to a Greylog party and discussed a lot with them. Um, so while I think we have some advantages uh, over Greylog, uh, I'm not saying that Greylog is a bad solution. I've used it in the past as well when it was still the party gorilla, which was like five years ago or something like that. Um, but it's just focused on one use case. 
That makes it, of course, very smooth for that one use case. Uh, but as soon as you want to break out of that one use case, uh, you probably cannot do that with uh, Greylog anymore. OK, next question. Logging in files versus logging in a DB. Yeah, the problem is, um, what if your network is down? Or what if your database is down? Uh, then you don't have any logs. And normally, that is the moment when you really want to see the logs. Um, whereas if you write to a log file, and especially if you write it, uh, to it in a structured format, Filebit basically has a pointer to what it has sent, and everything has been acknowledged from the other side, uh, everything it has sent in a log file. So even when a network is down or when the receiving system is down, Filebit will remember everything it has sent and keep that pointer. And that pointer will stay the same even over log rotations, because uh, we keep the inode, and the inode doesn't change over a move operation. So if you, even if you rotate the file, uh, it doesn't change. Um, and even if you're, the, the receiving system is down for an hour, we will still send all the log files afterwards. The other big advantage is if the network is down or if the database is down, you don't receive any logs. Whereas if you have the log files, the worst case is that you still fall back to less or tail or whatever you're using, and you will still see something. There is a slight overhead in writing the log file, but generally, I don't think that is the main bottleneck in most systems. Um, OK, next question. What do you recommend for cli web client-side logging? Um, yeah, normally you don't want to log directly for security reasons, but you want to send your logs to a proxy to do that for you. Um, we also have, um, since we're adding APM to our stack now, we have the real-time user agent uh, monitoring the RUM uh, thing. Uh, also for stack traces, we're adding that. Uh, so we will provide a solution for that as well um, with a RUM integration into client-side frameworks, which will uh, support React and Angular. It's, I think, in alpha or beta right now. Uh, but we'll get there, and we'll try to have a solution for client-side logging as well. Next question. When I restart logs test, does it make not sure to repass log files and create duplicates in Elastic? Um, well, it depends. Uh, A, how are you reading that, or how are you forwarding that? In my example, I have never read, read data directly with Logstash, because normally you don't want to roll out Logstash to all your instances, but Filebeat is sending everything. And Filebeat has a registry file, and it knows what it has already sent. If you use a container, what you should do is you should map that uh, or mount a specific file for that registry file outside of the container. So even if you replace the Filebeat because you have a new container of Filebeat, the registry file will still stay the same, and you will not resend the data. So that is generally what I would recommend, that you have Filebeat, and you mount the uh, registry file out of the container, so you will never resend your data. So that should not um, uh, go away. Ah, is Logstash going to die? That's a good one. Um, no, Logstash is not going to die. Um, basically, we're reducing the, the kind of like the use case of Logstash a bit more to what we now think it should be. It doesn't cover everything anymore, because Beats is taking like the lightweight side. But for heavier processes or all the parsing or enrichment, you will still need Logstash. We've also added ingest nodes, which can do a subset of what Logstash can do around parsing and ingestion. But it's only a subset. So if you have any heavier process, um, or if you need to co correlate or aggregate data together from multiple sources or multiple events, you will still need Logstash. Also, if you need to reach out to some API to get the data from there, um, and then store it somewhere else. That is what Logstash is for. So Logstash is not going away. It's just a bit repurposed in specific use cases. So you will not use Logstash or need Logstash for every use case anymore. But there are still plenty of Logstash use cases. And we are constantly adding new people also to the Logstash team. Though we have recently restructured the teams. And we have now an ingestion team. So it's one team working on Beats and Logstash. So it's kind of like one family of projects working more hand in hand. But Logstash is not going to die or go away anytime soon. Um, next question. What is the preferred way to write uh, if I don't have access to the file system, uh, re especially regarding outtakes? Well, if you cannot read the file, then you will need to forward it in some other way um, or work around that. Um, that will very much depend. But yeah, somehow you will need access to your log files to forward your log files. I'm afraid there is no magic there for that. Um, yeah. Any best practices for collecting heterogeneous logs? Uh, would you normalize them? So normalizing is an interesting one. Um, we're currently working on a common schema. Like every bigger system has their own common schema, and we're building our own common schema because you know 
one more standard is the solution for everything, and then it's one other more standard. Um, but yeah, we're building the, I think it's called the Elastic Common Schema, it's ECS. Uh, we're trying to build that, and that's what we normally try to map to that. But generally, um, as long as you have structured logs, heterogeneous doesn't matter that much, as long as everything is structured. If you need to write 100 regular expressions to parse different files, it will be a pain in the ass. Um, don't do that. As long as you have structured files, your life will be much better. Um, Next question, how do you combine with uh, Elastic Beanstalk? Um, I have honestly no idea. I have no idea how you can access the log files there. Um, maybe Logstash had a, has a plugin uh, to actually pull that out of the AWS API. Uh, that would be the right tool to do that, unless somebody has written a specific beat for that, which I'm not aware of. Uh, but yeah, depending on how you can access the Beanstalk logs, uh, that's the right way to go. Next question, is there any way to get alerts out of Elk? Yes, there is, but that is how my salary gets paid. So alerting, we have alerting, but that's one of our paid features. It's called, or it was called Watcher, now it's only called alerts anymore. Um, if you're using our own cloud service, not the one from AWS, but the one Elastic.co cloud service, it will be included for free. Otherwise, for an on-premise installation, uh, we do sell a commercial license for that. If you have questions around that, I can happily forward you to my sales colleagues. Uh, but I'm normally focusing on the open source side of things. Um, is there implicit metadata for performance measurements? Um, not really implicitly. I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, we have, I mean, we have metric beat, which is more around metrics and performance, and APM, the application performance monitoring. Those are our two tools around that for performance, uh, but not really for log files. Yeah, one more? One more. Okay, one, one more. Question, one more. Yeah. Uh, can log data contain nested data that can be uh, analyzed by Kibana, or is it always just a flat list key and values? Uh, no, you can do nested files. Uh, so um, it might not be super obvious, but uh, here, beat.hostname, that is actually nested. So if you see the structure here, uh, yeah, okay, you cannot see it. Uh, but you can see. Um, here you have some structure, uh, you have some uh, nested formats. So for example, you have the prospector, which is type log. You have beat with subfields, uh, so you can nest that. It's just JSON nesting, so that should be simple. Um, yeah. If you have any more questions, come to me afterwards. I'm happy to answer. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you very much, Philip.